Uh, many people like to take old houses and turn them into something more modern or take old houses and refurbish them. They might like to go to an antebellum home and they want to bring it back up to date or bring it, uh, refurbish it, make it nice and pretty like it used to be. Those dilapidated homes, maybe it's a Victorian home or maybe it's a cottage home. And there are a lot of people who are in that hobby where they want to refurbish those homes. And so they maybe purchase it in another community and they want to work on that. And that becomes something they're very interested in. But sometimes when that happens, of course, they hire contractors or frequently they hire a contractor or some consultant to help them get the house plans right, help it to come together as it needs to be. And when that occurs, there is frequently a, a priority list. Here's what needs to be done. And that priority list might be the plumbing, first of all, or it might be foundational work, or whatever it may be, but there has to be a lot of uh, priorities or things prioritized and what needs to be done first to make the house livable. So after that, they have, maybe that might be just a long, long list. So after that, they might leave and leave all in the hands of the contractor. Here's the contractor working on the house. And so let's just say that this person who's purchased the house, you've done this, and you've hired the contractor, the consultant, and you leave town, you come back in a couple of weeks, and your priority list has not been followed. They're not doing exactly what the priority list has in mind. Here's what needs to be done first, and the homeowner can know and does know what needs to be done first. And then we can work on the other things as they come down the list. But the contractor has started at the bottom of the list, perhaps, some of the minor details that really are not essential to the building of the house or to the refurbishing of this mansion or refurbishing of this antebellum home. Now, if that contractor stays on the job, which might be doubtful at this particular point, then the, the homeowner is going to line him out and say, here's what needs to be done. Let's get this priority list correct. So the homeowner leaves, come back in a couple of weeks, and what happens? When he comes back, he finds out that the contractor is not only not follow the priority list, but has done things that it's not on the list at all. He's built a gazebo in the backyard. He's put a fence up. He's done things that I didn't even ask for this. This is not what I want. Now, the contractor, of course, is going to be fired. Not going to stay there long, is he? And that's exactly what is happening here, even in this section. We have the big difference between what the homeowner has in mind, and what the contractor is actually doing. There's a huge difference, and that's exactly what's occurring in this particular section in Romans chapter 10, verses 12 through 21. And that is that Paul shows us, number one, what is the original plan? What God has intended from the beginning, the original plan, the real house plans that God has had always from the beginning. And then number two, he brings out, what, why did the contractor, country of Israel, the nation of Israel, why did they fail? How is it that they failed? And that's what Romans 10, verses 12 through 21 is all about. Back to the original plan, and why did the original contractor, the first contractor, fail? What was the failure? How did they fail? And all of this was foretold in the Old Testament, and Paul brings together a number of passages to show this was God's original plan from the beginning. And he speaks about, number one, Gentiles being part of the plan, that is, coming into the kingdom of God. You can see that immediately in verse 13. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a quote from Joel chapter 2, verse 32. This was God's plan always, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's God's original plan. And then, in the second portion of it, verses 18 through 21, he discusses what was the failure of this original contractor, so to speak, and that is Israel, the failure of Israel. What was their failure? And their failure was predicted in the Old Testament, foreseen by several prophets, Moses included, David included, Isaiah included. All of this was seen many years before by the prophets, and that's why those contractors, so to speak, are fired from the job. And that's exactly what we have right here. That's what Paul's doing in the section, in the section I call simply salvation to all. That is, it's not simply salvation is free, which we noticed last week, first portion of Romans 10, but salvation is to all, and that has been always God's intention. 
So let's think about both of these segments, the only two main points in this lesson. That does not, of course, preclude there might be subpoints involved in each. So let's look at number one, salvation to all. Let's, first of all, let's take an overview of what we have here in verses 12 through verse 17. That's all we're looking at, verses 12 through 17. Salvation to all. So Paul begins pointing out there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. That's verse 12. Then he quotes Joel in verse 13. You see that? Joel 2 and 32. That passage has been quoted more than once in the New Testament. It has been also quoted in Acts chapter 2 as well. Salvation is given to all. Then he tells us how the gospel is to be preached and why it needs to be preached. And he ends that lengthy statement there with a quote from Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 7, which tells us how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. That passage is from Isaiah. Now what's interesting about that passage is that Isaiah 52, in Isaiah, he is 8 centuries B.C. And he is transporting himself into the time when Israel has been in captivity, which took place in the 6th century B.C., and now they're ready to come home and there are just a few Jews left in the homeland, and a messenger comes over the mountain saying that the Jews are returning from Babylonian captivity. And so the response of the Jews at home is to say, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. And he's using that passage as a type of the gospel of Christ that's now being preached. So let's go back now. That's, that's the overview of what we have right here. Let's look at the passage Beginning in verse 12, Paul tells us, chapter 10, now verse 12, there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is rich unto all that call upon Him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe on Him in whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they did not all hearken or listen to the glad tidings. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Several things we want to note in this particular segment. Number one, you'll notice in verse 13, he says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We're looking at calling upon the name of the Lord. I mentioned last week that calling on the name of the Lord or calling on the Lord is Paul's shorthand method for speaking about obedience to the gospel. It does not refer to praying. It does not refer to audible voices being raised to God. It refers to obedience to the gospel. Now, I made that statement last week, and I want us to support it this week with a couple of passages. One of them is Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. In this text, Paul is giving us his recounting of his conversion. His conversion occurred in Acts 9. But now he's speaking about it in Acts 22. And he tells the king, as he's speaking about it, that he was, here's how it happened, that he, of course, was a, became a believer on the Damascus road. And he went into Damascus. He was blind. He did not eat three days and three nights. He was without food or drink. So... Racked was he with the pain of the guilt that he had for crucifying Christians or killing Christians. And Christ was alive. He had seen him on the Damascus road. But when Ananias came into him, Paul was not yet saved. And Ananias said to him, Why do you wait or why do you tarry? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Here is the New Testament definition of calling on the name of the Lord. It is done in obedience to the gospel, specifically in this text, in baptism into Christ. Here is how one calls upon the name of the Lord. Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Here's another text. <clears throat> this is from Acts chapter 2. Now back to Acts chapter 2. On the first gospel sermon, Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost. And when he comes down to verse 21, what is recorded in verse 21, he tells us this, quoting 
Same passage, Joel 2, verse 32, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But it is instructive for us to note that Peter did not follow that up by saying, therefore, we need to have a prayer or pray through for salvation or pray to ask Jesus into our hearts. Matter of fact, you don't find that anywhere in the New Testament. Nowhere. But you do have calling on the name of the Lord, and he told them, the believers, that they need to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Acts 2.38. Apparently, Peter believes or agrees with what Paul had to say, and that is that obedience, compliance with the gospel, is calling upon the name of the Lord. But we don't even need to go to other texts to look at it. Right here in this text, we have in the very context, the very statement that is made in verse 16. Look at verse 16. Now, they did not all, here's how the ASV that I have used reads. They did not all hearken to the glad tidings. But the word hearken means obey. And I believe that's the way Bruce's, Brother Johnson's translation quote, uh, reads that way. They did not all obey, and then glad tidings is gospel. They did not all obey the gospel. The reason I suppose that ASV translators put hearken or listen to the glad tidings is because he's quoting from Isaiah, and at that time the good news was the Jews are coming home. But here's what Paul has done. He's taken that particular text and applied it to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we have, call upon the name of the Lord, verse 13, but they did not all obey the gospel. You see how that lines up? It's exactly the same way. Calling upon the name of the Lord refers to obedience to the gospel, compliance. That is such an important point because there's so many preachers and so many pulpits who are so far off base on what it means to call upon the name of the Lord. Let's notice, secondly, in this segment, I want to focus upon verse 17. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. Hearing means, of course, complying. That is, we, are, we accept what is said, and it changes our hearts. Now, let's notice what Paul has had to say. He tells us why. He's told us what calling on the name of the Lord is. He's shown us that's important. That's absolutely not important only, but essential. Therefore, how shall they call on him in whom they have? Now listen to how this works. They have not believed. How shall they believe on him in whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except they be sent? Now let's first reverse the order of what has said right here. They're going to be sending the gospel preachers, going to send them. They have to preach it. They have to speak the word. They have to preach it. It doesn't have to be audible necessarily. It could be, of course, what the apostles are preaching right here. It could be what you read. But they have to be sent. They have to preach it. Then you have to believe it. Are you saved at that point? No. You have to call upon the name of the Lord. You have to comply. You have to obey. And that comes after you believe. The passage is so emphatically clear that one is not saved at the point of belief that it is amazing that so many people in religion believe that once you believe, then you are saved at that particular moment. But let's look even further. Let's dig deeper into this text. Verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. How is it that persons are saved. They're saved by compliance with what they hear. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is how it is done. So in Matthew chapter 22, in verse 30, this speaks about the word of God. Jesus is in debate with the Jewish leadership. And this, upon this particular occasion, it's the Sadducees, and they deny the resurrection of the dead. But he quotes a passage from uh, Exodus, Moses, where God spoke to Moses, but he's quoting the passage, and he says this, Have you not, or do you not know what is spoken to you by God? And he quotes the text. Isn't it interesting that he says, when the Bible is speaking, it is God speaking to you. That's how he quotes the Old Testament. Have you not heard that which was spoken to you by God? But it is quoting the Bible. When the Bible is read, the Bible is quoted, it is God speaking to you. That's why we have 
Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. The Word of God is living, it is active, it is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, quick to discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. It is a living Word. Denominational theology, hear me carefully, is built primarily on one of the concepts is that the Word of God is a dead letter. It is not able to do anything at all until it is enlivened by some miraculous operation of the Spirit. But that is not what the Bible teaches. Hebrews 4 and 12, it is a living Word. And it works. As a matter of fact, Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13, when you receive from us, talking to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13, when you receive from us the word of the message, even the word of God, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which works in you that believe. Here's the emphasis. It actually works in us and on us and in our hearts. The word of God is the instrument that works in us. It's a living word. And that's why James will say it this way, of his own will, he begat us, by the word of truth. James 1 and 18. Or receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. James 1 and 21. Or our own book right here, Romans 1 and 16. The gospel is God's power to salvation. One of the older debaters that I like to read after in the 19th century was T.R. Burnett. T.R. Burnett was a Texas preacher and in a debate with a primitive Baptist, he made an illustration I want to use for just a moment. Now, the primitive Baptists say that, of course, you can't obey. You can't look like you want to obey until the Holy Spirit actually hits you directly and moves you. And all denominations have some portion of that in their theology. T.R. Burnett went through some of these passages we've just looked at, and he said, "Here's just think about this illustration. He said, let's say that Someone has died from a gunshot wound. The coroner says and verifies that it was the bullet fired from this particular gun that killed this individual. Who are we to come along and say, well, you know, that person was also sick. He had COVID and that may have killed him. No, the, the, the coroner's report, the, the coroner's report says the bullet from the gun killed the individual. Well, well, it might be because uh, he had the flu also, or he had something else that was wrong with him, and he had such severe, uh, he had cancer, and that, was, that could have killed him also. The coroner's report said the bullet from the gun killed the man. The Bible teaches is the word of God that inserts itself into a person's heart, and that saves an individual. And why would people cast around for some extra outside influence some mysterious influence that the Bible does not define anywhere. It is, the, it is the Word of God, just like the bullet from the gun. It is the Word of God that converts an individual. And it's the Word of God that continues to build us up. It is God's power, the Spirit working through the message that is preached. And that's why Paul will say, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of Christ. It comes in no other way. That's why Paul says, I have to go and preach it. And that's why we say, we have all to go and preach it. It has to be through the message, and it comes in no other way. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. Isn't that simple? But sadly, this is point number three. Regarding the Jews, he said, they did not all obey the gospel. They did not hearken to the glad tidings. Majority of the Jewish nation, majority of Israel, repudiated it. And he will explain that in the next chapter a little bit more about why that is the case and how they're going to be saved. But for right now, he tells us in verse 16, they did not all hearken. They didn't listen to the glad tidings. And so, salvation to all persons, but it comes only by means of the word of God. All right, let's look at the second segment. And the second segment involves why the failure of Israel? We looked at God's original plan, salvation to all, but now why did the original contractor fail? What was going on here? 
How is it, how could it possibly be? So, overviewing the section, we'll see that Paul quotes from several texts in the Old Testament, one of them from Moses. Moses predicted a long time ago, this is exactly how it would be. And he quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 32. Then he quotes from Isaiah. Several passages, a couple of passages from Isaiah chapter 65, showing us that the Jews are not going to obey. And they were, they were rebellious back then. And Paul says, today, same way, they're rebellious. Now that's the overview of what happens here. And one of the interesting things about it is that when Paul quotes one text, he quotes it from David. That will be in verse 18. He quotes from David in Psalms 19. And what I want you to notice is Psalms 19. This is in verse 18 now. In Psalm 19, that psalm is about God creating the heavens and the firmament shows forth His handiwork. And then he makes a statement, David does, in Psalm 19. It utters speech day by day and utters knowledge night by night. What is he saying here? He's saying that even the heavens declare the glory of God, speaking a language that everyone understands that there is a creator. And Paul uses that in this segment to apply to the preaching of the gospel to the Jews. Now, why, how did that how does that happen? How does that work? Because that is a type of the gospel being preached to all creation, as Paul said had been done in his day, Colossians 1.21. So faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. So verse 18, But I say, do they not all hear? Yea, verily. The sound went forth unto all the earth, the words unto the end of the world. Moses says, Moses said, I was found of them that sought me not, or rather, um, Moses um, this is a verse, uh, let's see, lost my place there. Verse 20, or verse 19, Moses said, I will provoke you to jealousy with that which is no nation. With a nation void of understanding will I anger you. And Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found of them that sought me not. I became manifest unto them that asked not of me. And then he says this regarding Israel. Regarding Israel all day long, he says, all day long did I hold out my hands to a wicked and gainsaying or disobedient and gainsaying people. So let's go back to this statement that David makes in Psalms 19. That is, the heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament shows His handiwork, and day by day utters speech, night unto night utters knowledge. That is a type of preaching the gospel. But Paul's point is, they all heard. It's not a matter of Israel not hearing, that is, hearing the gospel. It's not a matter of that's the reason they've disobeyed. They've heard the gospel. He even tells us in Colossians 1 that the gospel has been preached to all the nations. So it's not the contractor was fired because he didn't understand. He heard it. And that's what his point is in Psalm 19 verse 4. But secondly, let's notice this question. Why do men, why do men reject the gospel? Why do men reject the gospel? And Paul gives us some straightforward talk right here. Why do people reject the gospel? Let's take up the Gentiles first. Regarding the Gentiles, back in chapter 1, he told us very plainly and bluntly, because they glorified him not as God, neither gave thanks, but became vain in their reasonings, and their senseless heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God for the likeness of an image corruptible man, birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Notice how their decline started. It started when they did not honor God. How do you honor God? You honor God by worshiping God. They failed to worship and honor God. There are many people in the world who believe in God, but they don't honor God. They don't attend worship anywhere. They don't attend worship in order to sing praises to God. They don't pray to God. They don't study. And what happens? Paul tells us specifically in Romans chapter 1. They become vain in their reason. That is empty in their reasonings. And their senseless heart becomes darkened. If we fail to acknowledge what we know to be true, we're doing wrong. We're doing wrong to God and we're doing wrong to ourselves. And that's exactly what happens in Romans 1. Why do the Gentiles reject God? That's Paul's discussion in Romans 1. They did it because they started by 
failing to acknowledge what they knew to be true. How many times have we thought about this community or the communities about us and how many people don't even acknowledge God on the day of worship that He has set aside to worship and honor God? A lot of people don't. They don't. And that sets them up for becoming senseless in their reasonings and becoming darkened in their thoughts. If you fail to acknowledge what you know to be true, that's the Gentiles. Let's talk about the Jews for a moment. Why do men reject the gospel? The Jews, according to chapter 10, where we are, in verses 1 through 3, we read very plainly that they sought to establish their own righteousness. That is simply to say... They rejected how God justifies a man and seeking to establish their own system of justification. Now that sounds like the contractor we talked about, doesn't it? Here's the plan. Here's what the owner of the house says I want you to do. But they said, no, we're going to do it this way. What's going to happen to the contractor? Fired. Because they follow their own plan and not what the owner of the house wants to do. That's exactly what happened to Israel. They didn't follow what God wants them to do. They said, no, we reject God's system. That is God's plan to make men holy and righteous. We reject it, but we're going to establish our own. We're going to go by our own blueprints. What are you going to do with that contractor? Out. And that's exactly what happened here. And he tells us that. As a matter of fact, he tells us Moses predicted it. I will provoke you to jealousy with that which is no nation. With a nation void of understanding will I anger you. And Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found of them that sought me not. I became manifest unto them that asked not of me. But as to Israel, he says, all the day long that I hold up my hands. That is, I invited them. All day long I invited. All day long that I hold up my hands to a wicked or a disobedient and gainsaying people. They were not going to follow God's plan. So they're fired from the job, so to speak. And that's what Paul's doing here. Now, it does tell us one more thing. Now, we've seen why men reject it. That is, they, didn't, they failed to acknowledge God, which many people do. Or the Jews, they said, I have my own plan. I'm going to do it this way. But it shows us something else underlying that. Let's see what it is. And that is that ignorance that is unlearned in the gospel is easier to deal with than people who are misled in their teaching. People who are unlearned are easier to deal with than people who are misled in their teaching. I, have, I can tell you a number of, a time, number of occasions when I have studied with someone, talked with someone. I'll open up the Bible here. I, I see it. I see it. So one must believe the gospel, must repent of his sins, be baptized in water, for the forgiveness of them, that, of course, shows you that it's an adult that's being baptized. And baptism is by immersion, Acts chapter 8. I see it, I see it. But they say, let me go ask my preacher. I say, okay. Go ask. Come back and say, well, no, he says I'm all right. I say, okay, now let me, I, I repeat, I said, you, you saw it. You see it. You acknowledged last week that this is exactly what needs to be done. And now you say... No, you're all right, because your preacher said you're all right. And he says, all you need to do is say a prayer to ask Jesus in your heart. I'll say, where, where is that in the New Testament? Where do we have that? That's not like the Jews, their own contractor, putting up their own plans, doing what they want to do. We reject what the plan is, and we're going to put up our own plan. Well, not, no, no, that's it. And they go their own way, because... People who are unlearned, they see it. But when they're mistaught, it's very, very difficult frequently to break through that kind of a barrier. That's exactly what Paul's talking about right here. And so he said, all the day long, I held up my hands to a disobedient and gainsaying. Gainsaying, that's an archaic word. ASV uses it. What is gainsaying? Rebellious. Bow up their back. I'll do it my own way. I'm going to do it my way. This is, how I, this is what I've been taught. This is what my father was taught. This is what my grandfather was taught. This is what my pappy was taught. My grandpappy was taught. I'm going to do it that way. Well, that's it. And people become very hardened in misteaching when they're misled. 
Sadly, but that's nevertheless true. And that's exactly what happened with Israel. They were mistaught by their own leaders. And so they were therefore lost. In spite of the fact that you cannot find perhaps a more religious people in Paul's day. Exceedingly religious, but they were lost. So also it is in our day. There are many people who are very religious, but they're lost. They've been mistaught. But the gospel is very simple. It's been pointed out already. But that's what's happening in Romans chapter 10. Here's the original plan. Why did the original contractor, the first contractor, failed? That's what Paul's doing right here in this section. The way of salvation pointed out. If you're not a Christian by faith, repentance, immersion in water for the forgiveness of your sins, now's the time to do it while we stand and sing the invitation song.